Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled The Seasons of Life. Uh, this is lesson number five in that series, and it's entitled Wise Words for Families, and it's the lesson from May 4 of 2019. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind Father, we thank you for the advice that you have given us generously in Scripture. And particularly, we're thinking today of the book of Proverbs and all the advice that's there, especially advice for our children and for young people from their parents, for husbands and for wives and for others that need to relate to each other. Help us to cover that material adequately as we study this lesson together as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Solomon is known as the wisest person that ever lived. Uh, how would you judge that? How would you determine that he was the wisest person that ever lived? Give him a quiz or? Tradition. Tradition. Certainly He's, not by his life. No. <laughs> Certainly by, by his behavior. He made some pretty poor choices. Yeah. Well, some of his words, and, and there's pretty good evidence that some of what he wrote was spoken before his time by others. There's pretty good evidence that it's almost word for word some of what he, uh, we have in the book of Proverbs was originally spoken by some wise people down in Egypt. So he, he remember, he, his first wife was an Egyptian princess. So that does, is not too surprising. Um, we also know that um, some of the book of Proverbs, chapters 25 to 31, were not added until a long time after Solomon was dead. And they, they say that these chapters were collected, were his collected statements and added uh, because they thought, I guess, they needed to be added. So this book was sort of put together here and there in different ways. So did um, Solomon put the others together as saying, this is a book of, gonna be a book of the Bible? Mm. Probably not. He probably wrote a bunch of Proverbs and somebody else who worked for him, perhaps, uh, put it together. Not, not, not to say this is going to be a book of the Bible, but this is something that was written by Solomon that is good advice for all of us. And then someone later said, you know, that would be good as a book in the Bible. They, so. they probably collected them as he wrote them. You know, this sounds like a good one. I'll just put that into the collection. Yeah. So they didn't consider it to be like the writings of Moses. At the time. Not at the time, I'm pretty sure. Now, having said that, we need to read one verse before we even jump into Proverbs, and that's found in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32. He composed 3,000 Proverbs and more than 1,000 songs. How many of his songs do we have? Just a few. Maybe three. So where are the 900 and other 997? Now, I'm sure that number is not exact, uh, unless somebody was counting, I don't know, but where are those songs? Maybe they were about his wives. Maybe so, <laughs> but is that bad? One, <clears throat> one so for each wife. <laughs> one for each wife, yeah, there we go. He had a thousand. <laughs> yeah, well, we only have a few hundred of his psalms, some around 500, I think it is, of, I mean of his proverbs, and we have almost none of his songs. Does that mean that the others were not inspired? Well, they, everybody talk people, about well people, whoever preserved it uh, must have felt that the ones, they were not as valuable may, maybe as the ones that were okay. preserved. Or maybe as he got older, he forgot what he wrote before, so there was quite a bit of redundancy. <laughs> that's, that's also possible. There's a lot of advice in the book of Proverbs, and it's hard to take it all in. And, and you know, today we are just inundated with advertisements and advice and counsel and this and that and the other. So you just, pretty soon you start saying, hold on just a minute, I can only take so much. Um, in fact, some of these things that, Pro that Solomon said in the Proverbs, or maybe he got them from somebody else, he, we, 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 we step back a second and we say, hold on, why did he say that? 
and we would like we wish we had the background behind it but of course if we had the background behind all that he says here we would have probably a book that was bigger than the whole bible just on the book of proverbs so i guess we won't have that medrash or whatever they call yeah, it yeah whatever <laughs> exactly well the focus on this of this lesson of course will be <clears throat> on the family all of us have parents uh, some of us may be we're fortunate enough even to know our fathers uh, in some cases not even to know our real mothers others of us have parents and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins and well you know that goes on and double cousins and what did they say third cousin lost somewhere <laughs> whatever okay but much of the book of proverbs was written in poetic form what does that tell us Well, we know that a lot of other wise sayings that were written in ancient times were written in poetic form. Maybe Appar it was easier to memorize. Yeah, in oral easier tradition. to remember. Be very that likely. My thinking on it. Very likely. The Book of Lamentations is a poem. This book, the Song of Solomon, which we're going to study pretty soon, uh, is, an, is a poem. Uh, the Book of Psalms is mostly poetry, if not entirely poetry. Proverbs would be more more useful to us if we understood the background, but we, of course, don't have all that. So let us think of the book of Proverbs as a letter from a wise father to a son or daughter who's about to leave for college, for a new job, or to get married. Some of the advice on Proverbs seems to be directly taken from the book of Deuteronomy with advice coming from Moses. And, and some of those advices clearly reflect Moses. Um, that advice from Moses that we have was mostly in the book of Deuteronomy. What do we know about the book of Deuteronomy? He put it together during the last month of his life, probably, right. probably in March of 1461. <laughs> no, you, you're just right. You're a little bit off there. It was the, the last yeah, month of his life would believe. would be about 1405, but you're close, not too far off anyway. Probably 1405. But it was in the last month of his life, if we believe the, what it states in the Bible. And it was done there on the plain of Moab. You know, they're camped there, looking across a, a raging Jordan River that was at high, high tide, or whatever you call it, full of spring, spring uh, floods. Across the, that flood, spring flood was the city of Jericho. And he gave three basic sermons, and he gave advice, a lot of very significant advice, at that time and that location, and only if they had only followed his advice. Mm -hmm. If they had only followed his advice. Well, one of the main sort of themes of Proverbs is beware. And let's read that from Proverbs chapter 5. I'm going to read 3 to 14. The lips of another man's mm -hmm. wife may be as sweet as honey and her kisses as smooth as olive oil, but when it's all over, she leaves you nothing but bitterness and pain. She will take you down to the world of the dead. The road she walks is a road to death. I don't know if that's talking about uh, sexually transmitted infections or what exactly. She does not stay on the road to life, but wanders off and does not realize what is happening. Now listen to me, my sons. We have no idea how many sons that Solomon had. And never forget what I'm saying. Keep away from such a woman. Don't even go near her door. If you do, others will gain the respect that you once had, and you will die young at the hands of merciless people. Yes, strangers will talk, take all your wealth, and what you have worked for will belong to someone else. You will lie groaning on your deathbed, your flesh, flesh and muscles being eaten away, and you will say, why would I never learn? Why would I never let anyone correct me? I wouldn't listen to my teachers. I paid no attention to them, and suddenly I found myself publicly disgraced. So That's, is that part your flesh and muscles being eaten away? Is that talking about tertiary syphilis? Could be. We just don't know. Yeah. Well, of course, we do know that there's a lot of talk in Proverbs about illicit sexual relationships. And uh, I don't think any of us who know a little bit about history would doubt the fact that a lot of illicit sexual relationships have tainted the lives of even famous people in the history of our world. In fact, Solomon was... Yeah. The second son of an illicit sexual relationship, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Mm -hmm. So the advice would be, choose carefully, love your mate, reserve your sexual relationships for that person. Um, 
Amen. And if you're not married, look for someone that you could live with for the rest of your life and be very happy with. You know, that really kind of makes it, uh, you wonder how come he turned out to be king when he had all these older brothers. He killed him. <laughs> well, yeah, but... Not all of them. Well. Yeah, no, but, but why would he have been chosen to be yeah. king since he was the youngest and he was the well, son not the of... Youngest. There were a lot of others that came after him. Well, but... Yeah. Younger than, yeah. Yeah, younger than all these older brothers. Might yeah. have been a promise to Bathsheba. Well, that's a distinct possibility that it was a promise to Bathsheba. He, he, that is mentioned, but that, he made that promise to Bathsheba. But we don't know if that's the reason he made that promise or whether he had some reason to believe that he was the best one of those sons. Considering the behavior of some of the other older sons who didn't make it, it's probably... Maybe yes. Bathsheba was a terrific mother. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for those of you who have a little spare time, I would suggest you read the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 12 to 15, because there's some advice for women as well, not just for men, about illicit sexual relationship. Um, she talks about being a walled garden or a private spring. What does that mean? Sounds like an intimate setting. Yes, uh, a, set, a, set, a setting that's not shared with other people, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, look at a couple of other passages. Look at Matthew 19, 5. And God said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. Now that's a Matthew, but where does it come from originally? Uh, it comes Genesis. from Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. And then there's 1 Corinthians 7, 3, and 4. A man should fulfill his duty as a husband, and a woman should fulfill her duty as a wife, and each should satisfy the other's needs. A wife is not the master of her own body, but her husband is, in the same way a husband is not the master of his own body, but his wife is. Think about all the possible implications of that. And look at Hebrews 13, verse 4. As soon as I get my cursor in the right place here. Marriage is to be honored by all, and husbands and wives must be faithful to each other. God will judge those who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Uh, well, that relationship between a husband and a wife should help to cement their love for each other. God intends for us to marry when we are relatively young, suggested as, as suggested in Proverbs 5.18, and to be excited and thrilled by our relationship with each other for the rest of our lives. In the next verse. Well, as we just read in, in Proverbs, I mean, sorry, in 1 Corinthians 7, 3, and 4, Paul advised that we do not even have the right to be attracted by someone who is not our contracted partner. <coughs> Excuse me. Our bodies belong to our spouses, and their bodies belong to us. But there is no question about the fact that sexuality is a powerful motivating force. All you do is have to have, been, those of us who live in this country, take a one look at Hollywood and what they produce and you realize that that's pretty obvious. And they use sex to advertise everything. Yeah. And, you know, and sex may not have anything whatsoever to do with what they're advertising. You know, yeah. that, that, that sort of, every once in a while, so why do they have that lady in the bikini? I mean, what does that have to do with kitchen soap or whatever it happens to be, you know? Good your tires. Good your tires. <laughs> So if we recognize this problem in our society, what can we do to control it? Well, obviously, if we have a great relationship with our spouse, that's a good start. Um, well, we can only control ourselves in the mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. I can't control everything that's out there, but I can avoid those. I can uh, divert my eyes. I can uh, try to avoid those situations where I know there will be problems. Yep. Unfortunately, we live in a world where a lot of people think that their own private sexual affairs don't involve anybody else. I'll just do what I feel like doing, and that's my business. But uh, faithful Christians, well, let me put it this way. Would a faithful Christ Christian have the right to advise somebody that was a friend or a neighbor that he knows pretty well, warning them about, getting involved in those kinds of relationships? 
It's good if you can do it in the right way, but there has to be a certain readiness that comes up for that other person. Don't just jump in. There are lots of verses in Proverbs. Just for example, Proverbs 13, 22, 27, 23, and 24. 14, 26, 15, 1, and 18. 16, 32, 15, 27, 29, 17. Just as an example of many verses in Proverbs about how fathers should relate to their children. Fathers are supposed to be good providers, not only from a financial perspective, but also good providers of clear, spiritual, biblic-based advice and example. They should not be quick to become angry, harsh, but, or harsh, but learn to be patient and be fully in control of their own passions. They should not be greedy and certainly not get involved in shady financial dealings. They should discipline their children in a loving, appropriate way. Um, but think of how fathers discipline their children. Does the child always feel loved at the end of that experience? Does the child see the parent as a loving and wise example, even a Christ-like example, when that just after the discipline takes place? It has been stated frequently by various authors that the most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. What does that imply? And they don't say that about women. Is that a... That, doesn't that, that, does that advice not go both ways? And then we know about the challenge of children of divorced parents. How does it impact them? And there's studies that show, okay, at certain ages they're much more susceptible to the problems that are associated with divorce and so forth. Well, what if the parents don't divorce but they're continually fighting? What is, how does that impact children? Not, Badly. Yeah, that's not good. How about after a divorce? Doesn't it make a difference in how the father treats his ex as well? <laughs> I mean, I to, this is a problem in our culture. It is. It's an amazing problem. Friends, I, you know. I, I could not believe it. It was on the national news recently. A lady got married and goes on her honeymoon, and she decides she wants to take her kids with her on the honeymoon from the former wife, former husband, and... Well, the former husband ought to come along, too, because, I mean, he wants to be with the kids, so this lady... <laughs> Where did we see this? I, 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 I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I tell you. Well, we went to a memorial not long ago for a guy that used to be a helicopter pilot here. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, we got to sit at a table not knowing where we did. We just sat down, didn't mm -hmm. say reserved. And we had both wives, the ex-wife and the current wife, at our table. And they seemed to get along pretty good. I see. That's an example yeah. to the kids. Yeah. Well, and we need to learn how to, know, to relate to other members of the family. You know, we know about sibling rivalry and that kind of stuff. Well, it should be clear that, one, loyalty to God, two, commitment to our spouses and our families, and three, integrity in one's personal community life are key themes in the book of Proverbs. Whatever sinful attractions might be luring us away from these ideals must be very strongly resisted by a Christian father and I would add a mother. Of course, these principles should apply to everyone, not just to fathers. For example, the principles in 1 Corinthians 13. One of the greatest challenges that parents, is, parents face is how to dis discipline in love. Parents should never discipline their children while they, are the, while they themselves are angry. That just gives the child an excuse to be angry and rebellious in return. I, every time I read a statement like that, I think of, unfortunately, there are a lot of examples, but one particular lady that comes to see me every once in a while and is, as a patient, and she brings two of her sons with her, and she just snaps at them. It seems like every five minutes she's snapping at them and they snap right back. Mm. And you think... She taught them. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. Children must be shown love always and must learn that it is the way God treats them as well. Um, well, what, are the, what do you think of these verses? Proverbs 10, 17... People who listen, to, listen when they are corrected will live, but those who will not admit that they are wrong are in danger. And what about this one? 
Don't hesitate to discipline children. A good spanking won't kill them. As a matter of fact, it might save their lives. <laughs> Do I hear any, pace, any parents saying, no, that's not true here? It's in a lot of trouble here if you get seen doing that. If you get more stubborn every time you are corrected, one day you'll be crushed and never recover. And then correction and discipline are good for children. If they have their own way, they will make their mothers ashamed of them. Well, you know, there are countries, entire countries in our world that have made corporal punishment against children. I don't know exactly how they define that. Against the law. Where is you, that at? In Scandinavia. Is it really mostly? Well, I don't know. It may be other places, but those are the ones that I know about. Corporal punishment isn't a choice then for parents in that culture. But God said at times it may be a good idea. This, of course, assumes that the discipline is administered in love. So why do we need to discipline our children? What should we do if they're exhibiting socially unacceptable behavior? Is that a time to discipline a child? What should we do if they're exhibiting socially, I'm sorry, what if they clearly disobey a command of God or of their parents? Does that justify discipline? Should children be disciplined if they do something embarrassing to the parents? No. <laughs> not, not if. <laughs> it, it sort of depends. I think that yeah. one could be uh, uh, up in the air. Well, clearly the purpose of parenting, and particularly the purpose of discipline, is to lead the children to love God. Gary, I think you have something about that. Yes. Christ is the, quote, light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, unquote. John 1, 9. As through Christ every human being has life, so also through him every soul receives some ray of divine light not only intellectual but spiritual power. A perception of right, a desire for goodness, exists in every heart. But against these principles there is struggling an antagonistic power. The result of the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is manifest in every man's experience. There is in his nature a bent to evil, a force which, unaided, he cannot resist. To withstand this force to attain that ideal which in his inmost soul he accepts as alone worthy, he can find help in but one power. That power is Christ. Cooperation with that power is man's greatest need. In all educational efforts, should not this cooperation be the highest aim? That came from Ellen G. White and Education. Wow. Cooperation with that power, that power which is Christ, is man's greatest need. Stop and think about that for a little bit and you say, mm -hmm. yeah. In every aspect of life. Yeah. Well, we can learn an important lesson from those who plant trees. When the tree is very young, it must be protected and nourished. It can be uprooted or bent or destroyed very easily. But as it grows, it becomes better able to survive the vicissitudes of plant life by itself. That's also true of children. Discipline in a Christian setting should not be regarded as punishment, but nor proof of the parent's authority over the child. Instead, it should be viewed as redemptive correction. I'm sure you've all used that on your children, right? Redemptive correction. <laughs> I don't think that's the way I viewed it. It was not the way you viewed it? Uh, when you were on which end of it? <laughs> the receiving end. <laughs> the receiving end. Um, think of how our, God, how God, our Heavenly Father, has dealt with us as a human race. What if every parent tried to discipline following the example of God? Well, well we, you know, he disciplined Adam and Eve after the mm -hmm. fall, and we still have lots of misery here. So mm -hmm. uh, we attempt to deter bad behavior, but uh, it still finds ways of breaking out. He Moses even got a little discipline at the end mm -hmm. of his life. Yeah. Yeah. You think how little it seems that Aaron got when he needed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Proverbs 13, 24 says, if you don't punish your son, you don't love him. 
If you do love him, you will correct him. Uh, in the King James Version, I think that's the verse that says, spare the rod and spoil the child, or that may have been Benjamin Franklin's version of that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the rod. The word rod is not used very often in the Bible. Shepherds used a rod to guide their flocks, and some in, the, in Revelation talks about Christ ruling with an iron rod. Uh, that sounds a little harsh and authoritarian to us, doesn't it? But what, if you know those rods, what actually happened was there was usually a wooden stick and there would be an, a metal iron point on it. And that point was used as a weapon to, to, to fend off wolves and things like that or to you know, dig up something in the ground that was not good for the sheep or so forth. So it was actually a very good thing for the benefit of the sheep. Well, on, in Psalms, uh, the 23rd Psalm, mm -hmm. is your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Yes. So there it is. that's a good way to get the guide and to protect. Yep. yep, exactly. Sends you in the right direction. You're right. Well, discipline and guidance must be administered in a loving and redemptive way. A child's loving feelings for his parents is vital if delivered, if delivered discipline is to have its desired effect or be corrective and redemptive. If the child is already rebellious and already unhappy with the parents, doesn't like what the parents are doing, it's going to be a challenge. If we have ever been tempted as parents to lose our tempers and discipline and anger, how do we correct that with our children? You apologize. Apologize? Well, there's, yeah, go ahead. As a parent and having three children that had very different personalities. Yes. My discipline tactics were different with each one. Yes. And I apologized to the first one a lot more than the third one. <laughs> <laughs> first one always gets the brunt. Uh, yeah. And she was the most rebellious. Yeah. So. Is that, be, is that because she uh, was? I, it was personality we're, we're, and... We're not and, trying to admit anything yeah. right here. <laughs> it turned out just fine, but... Yeah. Often it's the second child that you have the most trouble with. Yeah. yeah. In my experience. Well, there are some people I know of who admitted at a certain point in their lives that they didn't mind being disciplined by the parent, parents, even sometimes getting spankings because the parents would go so out of their way to make it up to them afterwards. Mm, compensation. <laughs> yeah. Compensation. What about that? Parents felt guilty for having overdone it, maybe. <laughs> maybe so. Another few verses. Look at Proverbs 21, 9. Better to live on the roof than share the house with a nagging wife. Whoa. And then verse 19, better live out in the desert than with a nagging, complaining wife. And then 27, 15, and 16, a nagging wife is like water going drip, drip, drip on a rainy day. How can you keep her quiet? Have you ever tried to stop the wind or ever tried to hold a handful of oil? I don't know, Solomon sort of sounds like he had some experience, huh? Yeah, he probably. <laughs> <laughs> out of a thousand wives, you've got to have a few nagging ones. Yeah. <laughs> he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Have you ever stopped to figure out how long it would take you to marry a thousand? How many children did he actually have? Yeah, uh, you know, know, if Gideon had 70 sons, yeah. many wives, <laughs> think of what, there had to be a hundred times that many kids with a thousand wives. Well, <clears throat> Did, did Solomon find that he, it was his job to sort of, or did, let put it this way, did he try to avoid some of his wives? Probably. <laughs> well, were these verses intended to be a serious commentary, or was this Solomon trying to introduce a little humor? Ladies, speak up. This is your... <laughs> Maybe a little of both. Yeah. I, I, it's curious that some of... Proverbs were written by women, mm -hmm. so I've been told. This is obviously written by a man. Yes. Mm -hmm. My guess is it could probably go both ways, except that women didn't have many husbands. Yeah. <laughs> well, look at uh, Proverbs 25, 20. Singing to a person who is depressed is like taking off his clothes on a cold day or like rubbing salt in a wound. Wow. 
Some of us know Dr. Graham Maxwell, his father, affectionately known as Uncle Arthur and wrote a lot of books under that title, under that name, used to rise very early in the morning and wake up his children to go out and work in the garden. And he would say, quoting Proverbs 24, 33 to 34, have a nap and sleep if you want to. Fold, this is, of course, after he's woken them up. Fold your hands and rest a while, but while you are asleep, poverty will attack you like an armed robber. <laughs> And Graham, later in his life, knowing more a lot more about the Bible, wished he had known at that time about Proverbs. I'm sorry, I just read your verse, Margaret. That's okay. D he th wished he'd learned about Proverbs 27, 14. And Jim? You might as well curse your friends as wake them up early in the morning with a loud greeting. <laughs> it's a good news <laughs> Bible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. What do you suppose? He used to, Dr. Maxwell used to also say that um, he wasn't too fond of broccoli when he was younger. And his father would say, you eat that. And he wished he had gotten wise and said, but you know, the, veg the, the, diet, the, 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 the diet that was originally given to man was fruits, nuts, and grains. So that doesn't include broccoli. Leave out those veggies. <laughs> but then he sure his father would have said, but sin, broccoli was added after sin, and that's why you need to eat it, you little sinner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, being cheerful keeps you healthy, healthy, according to Proverbs 17, 22. It is a slow death to be gloomy all the time. How many of us have known people that seem to be gloomy all the time? Um, what, what kind of influence do they have on other people around them? Definitely downers. Mm -hmm. A constant level of quarreling, nagging, and complaining can indicate that there are some serious problems under the surface. Just as when a person has a chronic temperature elevation, that might be a sign of some more serious disease. Those kinds of problems in a family need to be dealt with. They should not be avoided or ignored. Members need to build on their love for the Lord and their commitment to each other by communicating their needs and feelings and thus get to the root of the problem and hopefully clear it up. Is that um, a good plan? Have you ever tried it? Might depend a little bit on the individual's no. personality. Yeah. How they do that. Yeah. Why is laughter important for the home? It makes it a pleasant place to be. Okay. Can it be used for good sometimes? Mm -hmm. what, what is it that causes us to smile or laugh? Our, one person described it as a surprise to the mind. Yes. The unexpected word, action, or visual scene. By exaggerating, exaggerating the unexpected, we cause people to think about what has happened and why. It can serve as an opportunity for considering some necessary correction to one's behavior. Um, if it's done right and if it's understood correctly. Well, there's an, Myra, here comes your passage. There's an incredible passage of Scripture found in Proverbs 31, 10 to 31. Do you perhaps know some, and of course this is a story about the so-called ideal wife. Do you know any young men who have looked at this passage and then sought to find a wife that would fit? I, I know some, and as long as they kept that standard, they didn't find any yeah, wives. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Let's read, in order to understand this, we need to go back to the beginning of the chapter and read the first few verses. These are the solemn words of which King Lemuel's mother said to him. So, one of the things we need to notice is, in terms of actual scriptural material, now there are other parts where women are quoted because they said something, uh, but this is the only passage in Scripture that sort of, okay, it's, it's like she con composed this portion of Scripture. Well, is King Lemuel, do you suppose that was Solomon? Well, a lot of scholars think that that's likely. So then that would have been come that, from Bathsheba. That would have been from Bathsheba. A wise woman, perhaps. Well, I don't think... We're, talking, we're saying that even... A woman who had an illicit sexual affair can be an author of the Bible? Well, her husband was an author of the Bible, wasn't he? 
Yeah, but that, that's different. That's a man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Step into a hole here. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing about this um, passage, uh, clearly the woman described in Proverbs 30, 31 was remarkable. Now, I'm sure that Bathsheba didn't have to spend a lot of time working hard. Mm -mm. These 22 verses are written in the form of poetry. They are an acrostic poem. What's an acrostic poem? Mm -hmm. We don't see it done much in English. There's good reasons for that, but in these ancient, there's quite a few acrostic poems in the Bible, actually. It's a case where, and uh, when we study the book of, uh, the perfect example is the book of Lamentations. The first chapter has 22 verses, the next chapter has 22 verses, the next chapter has 66 verses, the next chapter has 22 verses, and the last chapter has 22 verses. And the reason is because, and I'm using the, uh, we have to use the Hebrew alphabet, which had 22 letters in it, but it's like the first verse starts with an A, and the next starts, verse starts with a B, and the next verse starts with a C. Of course, those are Hebrew letters, not, not our English letters. But, and then it all, goes all the way through the alphabet, and to the, to the last, when it gets to the last letter, that's the end of that chapter. And then in, in chapter 3 in Lamentations, there are three verses that start with A, and then three verses that start with B, and then three verses that start with C, and so mm -hmm. forth. So that's an acrostic. So this is an acrostic poem. Verse 10 starts with Aleph, and, and, and verse 11 starts with Beth, and verse 12 starts with Gimel, and down through the Hebrew alphabet. So what kind of education produces that yeah. in a woman? Yeah. That's yep, something to exactly. think about. I read that and thought, boy, she must have been a smart woman. Yeah. To be able to structure it like that. There was a, a, a gentleman who tried, and I can't remember which chapter he tried it with, a Bible translator that tried to do it in English instead of the Hebrew, and it was hard. Because you have to not only translate what the Bible says, but try to pick the letters and see if you can make it work. Yeah. It, it, that's, that's a real challenge. I had to change the first word on a lot of them, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so. And rearrange the sentences sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But many people think that this passage is the best part of the book of Proverbs. If so, why wasn't this chapter included in the Proverbs originally? Put together by Solomon? I mean, if, if it is advice from his mother, Bathsheba, to Solomon, you would have thought this would be somewhere near the beginning of the book, wouldn't it? Why did it not get put in until many hundreds of years later by Hezekiah and his friends? Now he says that it was, it was you know, the advice from Solomon. He says that, but it wasn't included in the book of Proverbs until a long time later. Well, there's an ancient dictum from one of the rabbis which says a man's home is his wife. And Proverbs 12.4 says something like that. Gordon? No, I have Oh, it's Myra. I'm sorry. A good wife is her husband's pride and joy, but a wife who brings shame on her husband is like a cancer in his bones. Well, you can claim that first part of the verse. Yeah. Well. But at least it should be clear that Proverbs tells us that there are certain characteristics that would be desirable in a husband or a wife. Trustworthiness, compassion, reliability, faithfulness, kindness, and industry. Those are some of the things that are, that are encouraged in that chapter. And, of course, these things come about because the husband or the wife has reverence for the Lord. So, Christians Lord. should be careful that, that they keep the heart with all diligence. They should cultivate a love for meditation and cherish a spirit of devotion. Many seem to begrudge moments spent in meditation and the searching of the scripture and prayer as though the time thus occupied was lost. I wish you could all view these things in the light God would have you, for you would then make the kingdom of heaven of the first importance. Mm -hmm. These are words from Ellen White. To keep your heart in heaven, you will give vigor to all your graces and put life into all your duties. To discipline the mind to dwell upon heavenly things will put life and earnestness into all endeavors. Our efforts are languid, and we run the Christian race slowly and manifest indolence and sloth because we so little value the heavenly prize. 
We are dwarfs in spiritual attainments. It is the privilege and duty of the Christian to be increasing in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As exercise increases the appetite and gives strength and health, strength and healthy vigor to the, bi to the body, so will devotional exercises bring an increase in the grace and spiritual vigor. That's Ellen White in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 3. I, I thought we weren't going to have time to do this, but I think we can manage. I'm going to read you uh, at least a portion of this key Proverbs, chapter 31. How the capable wife, how hard it is to find a capable wife. She is worth far more than jewels. Her husband puts his confidence in her and, she will, and he will never be poor. As long as she lives, she does him good and never harm. She keeps herself busy making wool and linen cloth. She brings home food from out of the way places as merchant ships do. She gets up before daylight to prepare food for her family and to tell her servant women what to do. These are the reasons why I'm questioning whether this would have been Bathsheba. She looks at land and buys it and with money she, was, she has earned, she plants a vineyard. She's a hard worker, strong and industrious. She knows the value of everything she makes and works late into the night. She spins her own thread, and weaves her own cloth. She is generous to the poor and needy. She doesn't worry when it snows because her family has warm clothing. She makes bedspreads and wears clothes of fine purple linen. Her husband is well known, one of the leading citizens. Now, uh, in, in the King James it says the husband sits in the gates and people say, wow, this husband is doing nothing. Well, we need to understand that they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have radio, they didn't have TV, they didn't have regular telephones. The only way you could do business with people that you need to get in touch with is, is to go down to the city gate. And there, if you look at the ancient cities, they had multiple chambers at the, at the city gates. So and you'd wait there until so-and-so that you needed to talk to would come along, and you'd say, okay, I want to talk to you, and you'd jump into one of these little side rooms, and you'd do your business with them. That's the way you kept in touch. So that's why our translation says, my translation, this Good News Bible says, her husband is well known, one of the leading citizens. He's not just sitting there. I think they would execute judgment there, or at yeah. least to decide things. There are often, often judgments were made there as well. She makes clothes and belts and sells them to merchants. She is strong and respected, not afraid of the future. She speaks with a gentle wisdom. She is always busy and looks after her family's needs. Her children show their appreciation and her husband praises her. He says, many women are good wives, but you are the best of them all. I hope all husbands say that to their wives. Charm is deceptive and beauty disappears. That's unfortunate, isn't it? But a woman who honors the Lord should be praised. Give her credit for all she does. She deserves the respect of everyone. So that's the passage we're talking about. So let's drop down here again. Many of the problems discussed in this lesson are ubiquitous. If you have one or more of these temptations, you are certainly not alone. In modern times, it has been found that support groups, where all those involved are facing the same kinds of temptations, are often very helpful in keeping one safe. And of course, the, the most traditional one that we all have been around for a long time is the 12-step program. Uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, and now there's all sorts of spin-offs of Alcoholics Anonymous, even one for obesity and so forth like that, that use a similar technique. So, we have suggested that humor can help to smooth out the rough spots in a relationship. But using humor to make fun of someone, or even to disgrace them, is never helpful. Mm -hmm. Think about the type of women that are promoted in Hollywood movies. How many of them would match up to Proverbs 31? And I'm not talking about the actual women, I'm talking about the way they're portrayed. Often men are attracted to women because of their outward beauty. While that is a great asset for a woman, it may not be lasting. That is why it is said, Men marry women hoping they won't change, but they do. Women marry men hoping they will change, but they, but don't. they don't. The author apparently <laughs> is unknown. Oh dear. So. What's that talking about? Expectations. Mm -hmm. And why do they... Between men and women, huh? obviously. Yeah. 
Wait. Why do these things change or not change? Well, we know about looks. I mean, that's something that nobody can control. Many try. What? You say many try. Many try, yes. You know? And age, you don't have too much to do about that. But yeah. thankfully, that's all temporary when yes. you look at the greater picture. What ideas do you find developing in and around you and in your culture that are in conflict, conflict, conflict with what we have learned in this lesson? Should Christians speak up on behalf of biblical principles? You know that we have a vice president right now that gets just lambasted in, in, in some news, uh, news things if he speaks up in any way about Christianity and about Christian principles and so forth. They just rake him over the coals. There are rising political forces that are doing everything they possibly can to do away with biblical principles. There are some that you may have heard about now suggesting that if you wanted to be a part of the Congress of the United States, you should renounce any connection with any religious organization. To renounce a connection with most religions might be a good thing. Well, that's not what it says, though. And, of course, you can, uh, if you know how the different parties are aligned and so forth, it's not hard to feel, understand why some wish, wish we, they could you know, eliminate that alignment. Well, how do you feel about that? Should we continue? I mean, our government was founded by religious people. And, uh, and basically to support religious freedom. As long as there's religious freedom, it's, it's okay. It's when yeah. I try to enforce my religion on you or someone else, that's when it's a problem. Well, we've already talked about illicit relationships. I guess we can look at a couple of verses here. Proverbs 2, 16 to 19. You will be able to resist any immoral woman who tries to seduce you with her smooth, smooth, smooth talk who is faithless to her own husband and forgets her sacred vows. If you go to her house, you are traveling the road to death. To go there is to approach the world of the dead. No one who visits her ever comes back. He never returns to the road to life. So you must follow the example of good people and live a righteous life. Wow. And we've already looked at uh, Proverbs 5. Look at Proverbs 7. Treat wisdom as your sister and insight as your closest friend. They will keep you away from other men's wives, from women with sedu seductive words. Once I was looking out the window of my house and I saw, uh, I saw many inexperienced young men, but noticed one foolish fellow in particular. He was walking along the street near the corner where a certain woman lived. He was passing near her house in the evening after it was dark. And then she met him. She was dressed like a prostitute and was making plans. She was a bold and shameless woman who always walked the streets or stood walk, waiting at a corner, sometimes in the streets, sometimes in the marketplace. She threw her arms around the young man, kissed him, looked him straight in the eye and said, I made my offerings today and I have the meat from the sacrifices. So I came out looking for you. I wanted to find you and here you are. I have covered my bed with sheets of colored linen from Egypt. I perfumed it with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come on, let's make love all night long, and so forth. I don't know if we really need to read the whole thing, but obviously this is not the way to go. These, these passages clearly talk about the challenges of illicit relationships. How can parents protect their children to get sucked into such kind of problems? Uh, this is from uh, the Adult Sabbath School uh, Bible Study Guide. Um, and I'll be reading the first paragraph of it. God is a risk taker. He willingly created free moral agents with the potential of loving him or wanting nothing to do with him. In a sense, God lost his own wager. His universe rebelled. Only Satan and his followers and humans on this world rebelled. He, that is God, lost one third of his angels. He lost his humans. Worst of all, his own son was murdered by the very ones he created. Yet for God, it was all worth it for the sake of having a family. Continuing, is there any institution in existence that can possess such opposing realities as that of the family? On one hand, it can provide the apex of security and love. On the other, it can breed the deepest pain and resentment, mask the most shocking violence, and disfigure the souls of its offspring. 
When we start our own families, we participate in the divine risk of creating relationships. We choose a spouse, initially a total stranger to us, with an unknown future to bind our lives with forever. We have children that are bundles of joy, but we soon realize they also are bundles of potentialities, in which that initial joy is either extended or terminated in pain and heartbreak. And yet we, like God, continue to merge our lives with others to create families. Why do we do that? Perhaps the lyric of a Bob Bennett song, Nail a Truth Worth Pondering, Love is the only risk worth taking. Think that's true? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think so. Mm -hmm. God recognizes that true love, and we've talked in the past about the fact that love is not possible unless you have freedom. God recognizes that true love in the setting of an ideal marriage is what he really wants and needs in our, in our world today. That is why he gave those guiding principles in the beginning as recorded in Genesis 1, 28 and 2, 4. Carrie, I think you have something on that. Yes. God has bound our hearts to him by unnumbered tokens in heaven and in earth. Through the things of nature and the deepest and tenderest earthly ties that human hearts can know, he has sought to reveal himself to us. Yet these but imperfectly represent his love. Though all of these evidences have been given, the enemy of good blinded the minds of men so, so that they looked upon God with fear. They thought of him as severe and unforgiving. Satan led men to conceive of God as a being whose chief attribute is stern justice, one who is a severe judge, a harsh, exacting creditor. He pictured the Creator as a being who is watching with jealous eye to discern the errors and mistakes of men, that he may visit judgments upon them. It was to remove this dark shadow by revealing to the world the infinite love of God that Jesus came to live among men. That's from Ellen Weiss' Steps to Christ. That's just beautiful. Wow. <clears throat> oh, wow, wow. And think of the, what blows me away on a quotation like that is think of how the church has used, and I'm using the church in the largest possible context, uh, has used force and, you know, the, the, the fear of, being, of losing your salvation. You know, if you don't do what we tell you to, mm -hmm. if you don't, you know, bring the monies, if you don't support this church, if you don't do this and this and this, you know, you're going to be lost, we'll, you'll burn forever in hell, and so forth. I mean, just think of this. That, and this has been done in the name of religion. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Satan is doing everything he possibly can to misrepresent God and tear apart loving marriages. Can you think of individuals and or groups down through history that have misrepresented God in these ways and tried to tear families apart? God went so far as to picture himself as a father and a husband. Exodus 4, 22 and Jeremiah 31, 32. Jesus is also pictured as a son, a bridegroom, and a brother. John 3, 16, Mark 2, 19, Romans 8, 29. Why do you think God is using these types of relationships based on the family to represent his love for us? Those are the closest ties that we know. Mm -hmm. So that's what he, <clears throat> he's Building trying to... Building blocks of society. And we have to, we have to. to use... Our language that, that, that's yeah. something, yeah, our experience, yeah. exactly. Our experience. Obviously, no one has lived in or was raised in an ideal family, no one here on this earth. When he was asked what he thought of God as a father, a young boy who was taken from a downtown ghetto to a camp for children to get away from the influences of the inner city said, if he's like my father, I sure would hate him. That's so sad. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 7, I think we have time to read that. Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Never forget these commandments that I'm giving you today. Teach them to your children. Repeat them when you're at home and when you're away, when you're resting, and when you are working. As we turn to the words, those words given by Moses to the children of Israel on the border of the land of Canaan, he emphasized that we need to teach our children repeatedly and intensively, drilling biblical principles into their minds and hearts. How do we do that? 
Well, as, as loving parents, as Christian parents, we need to be as much like Christ as we possibly can. That would be step one. We need to, tr even when we discipline our children, we need to do it in love. Young, especially young children, the only authority figures they know are their parents. Sometimes children ask why we do certain things. Sometimes they will ask, why do we go to Sabbath school? Why do we go to church? What is the point of Christian ceremonies? Are we demonstrating, um, I'm sorry, are we demonstrating in our own lives what Sabbath school and church mean to us? How well are we doing as a generation of Seventh-day Adventist parents instructing and guiding our children to love the Lord? Anyone know what our success rate is? It's pretty poor. Yeah. Pretty poor. And why would that be true, do you think? Well, there's a lot of worldly attractions. Okay. There's so much technology that yeah. keeps us, mm -hmm. our young people especially, from spending and quiet time. And who's responsible time. for all that? No quiet time. for. Well, the technology can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And yes, this is true. But I always try to remember when I study these lessons about the great controversy, who is out there doing everything he possibly can to destroy the children of Christian parents? Well, I think they see con inconsistency in our lives as well, mm -hmm. that we, you know, we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk, always. And what does that say to our children? That we're not, sin that we're not sincere. We're not serious. Yeah. Must not be that important. Must not be that yeah. important, or, or, or it must not even be true. Yeah. Whatever we say, maybe it's not true. Well, and so I, I'm going to say something that I've said before, but uh, I hope you won't take me uh, to task for it, but I think it's true. No other group in history has been blessed with as much helpful information as we have been. We have not only all the Bible, we have all the writings of Ellen White. We have the guidance of others who have used those resources. We are just inundated, if you will, with good advice, and how well are we using it? Are, we, are our children really, do our children know the Bible better than any previous generation? I'll let you answer that question. Is that true in your church? Our kind and wonderful Father, would that we could be the kind of parents that you are. Would that we could treat our children the way you always treated us as your children. We thank you for this opportunity to study a few of the principles from Scripture, especially from the book of Proverbs. Help us to know how we can live better lives, to be examples not only to our own families, but to all those around us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.